when you don't have that, you're grinding out on a paid basis every impression and every interaction. And there's no halo organic flywheel. There's no virality. There's nothing that supplements it. And eventually that just degrades down to nothing. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing is that the, just the absence of anything interesting is not a good business to be in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the e-commerce playbook podcast. I'm your host, Richard Gaffin, director of digital strategy here at Common Thread Collective. And I am joined, as I always am, by Taylor Holiday, CEO of Common Thread Collective. Taylor, how are you doing today? Doing well, sir. Toggling back to the philosophy world here a, t- a touch uh, yeah, after right. sort of ping-ponging between philosophy and finance. Yeah, and it was, this is an interesting one because this concerns an attempt to transform, let's say, philosophy or something that's sort of quantifiable into something that's a little bit more down to earth. So last week, I know you talked to Ezra a little bit, or you, rather you kicked that conversation off with a discussion about the importance of brand. And in this current environment, being brandless, being purely commodified, like that just won't work anymore. And the thing that matters most is brand. So that's what the conversation today is going to be about. And what we're framing it with is a sort of a game of defend that tweet. And yeah. Taylor on March the 20th, which will have been last week, Monday, when this comes out, tweeted the following, and I'll read it out. Brand is measurable. We're starting off already provocative. Just right? definitive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brand is measurable, period. Here is the calculation. Awareness times sentiment times customer LTV equals brand value. So awareness equals the number of people who know who you are. Sentiment equals, on a scale of 1 to 10, how positive are those people's perception of you. And then customer LTV, of course, is the medium, median customer spend over five years. So maybe we'll kick it off just asking why. What was the impetus behind tweeting this out? I am thinking all the time about why some brands succeed and some brands don't. Okay. So we work with, in you know, an agency over the course of a decade, you work with thousands of brands. Some of them have wild success. Some of them have virtually no success. And I will watch every day the same group of humans, okay? Same team deploying the same strategies, the same mental capacity, the same tactics on different brands and producing wildly different outcomes. And so when I look at what are the variables that contribute to success, people are constant in that scenario but the outcomes are still really different. So it's not just people. Now, I'm not saying that there's no impact there, but I'm saying that the same quality of people can produce different outcomes. So that's insufficient on its its own. Um, I think product is obviously a big piece of this, where I have seen products that just have a great predisposition. But I actually think all of these are subsidiary to a third thing, which is especially as I have gotten into, as CTC has matured and we've gotten the opportunity to work with bigger and bigger, more and more well-known brands, you begin to recognize the immense power that they hold. And I'm going to describe that power just simply as the ability to efficiently acquire customers to their competition. And so what I start to, to think about is like I had to measure that because there's been a lot of debates lately on Twitter and socials, other words, that like brand is not a thing you should worry about and you shouldn't talk about it. And it's like ephemeral and it's not real. And so stop talking about it. And I just think the exact opposite is true. I think it's like the most important thing to try and understand and to start to begin to measure. And so I, I, I just, I used to think it was just CLV that like that was actually the best measure of a brand was how much money they spent with you. But in thinking through my own life, that's probably insufficient because there's some things that you buy once, like maybe a private jet that you would net, that's not a, like a recurring purchase, but maybe that's the total value. I don't know. So I just started thinking about, okay, what else would go into it? And this was my formula that I, I believe if we could run this calculation for every brand in the world, that we would see a distribution that probably maps to what we would imagine are the best brands in the world. You'd see the Nikes, Apples, Cokes, Toyotas way on the far right. And then you'd see fledgling startups you'd never heard way on the left. And I think the distribution would be really good and it would p- correlate really positively with their Facebook p- prospecting grow ass. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think it would be cool to, at some point we should do host just doing that, running that through this formula ringer to see if it makes sense. But so there was a couple, as we go through this, there was a couple of responses to this particular tweet, which I think are interesting. Um, so the first is from Franz Sauerstein, who replies, a sentiment needs a probability of actually turning into a customer. I'm aware of Tesla. My perception is neutral. My inclination to buy one is zero. Thus CLV doesn't matter. 
Um, also, there might need to be a measure of aware right people. To which you respond, I don't think that's necessary. So maybe <laughs> unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So I actually think that sentiment is more of an indication of your likelihood to purchase than you realize, okay? Because right. just use Tesla as an example. There's lots of contributing factors that go into whether or not you're in market or likely to make a purchase for a Tesla. Some of them you may not be totally talk cognitively aware of, but let's just go through a few examples. Like one is like, do you need a car? If you have a fully functioning car, whether you like Tesla or not, you're not likely to be a customer in that moment. Right now, I am not likely to be a customer of Tesla. I have two functioning working vehicles. I'm not looking to buy a car anytime soon. But my sentiment, I think, still matters because someday I may be ready to buy a car. And at that moment, it's going to matter. Mm -hmm. Second is like, I might not be able to financially afford it. Like at this moment today, but maybe in five years, my financial standing might be different. And so suddenly that sentiment now has an overlap with likelihood of purchase that still, I think, makes me, if I have a positive sentiment, a more likely customer and a person I would rather advertise to than someone who had a negative sentiment about me to begin with. Um, so I think that that, when I say, when I responded and said, I don't think it matters, I think that you are applying on top of that a personal situ circumstance that I think sentiment is actually a better, awareness and sentiment are actually a better indication of purchase potential than you're giving credit for, given the right circumstance. And also, I think in this scenario too, he's sort of talking about taking himself on the individual level when actually like on aggregate, there are plenty of people who need cars and would actually be actively in market. So maybe that does it, it would apply, like maybe that would be interesting if there was some brand with a lot of awareness, positive sentiment, and for some reason, nobody needed the product. I can't think of what that would be. Yeah, but exactly. If, if that would be the case, then maybe that would be a valid argument. Yeah, that's a really good example. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe the product is like the Olympics or something that's like, I don't, what is my actual, where you don't actually make a purchase interaction with it, but the monetization of it is separate or something. Look, there. I think this is like, my least favorite thing about some, some of the way that people engage Twitter, which is like big, broad, general idea, really nuanced, specific edge case response. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are infinity edge cases where this probably breaks down. But my belief is that if you plotted the respondents here, and I get it, my job to go through this. And I think there are some ways that we could actually do this that would be fun. Like we could come up with a proxy metric for brand awareness, like branded search volume. So if you did like number of monthly search query or that person and use that as input number one. And then we'd have to figure out the sentiment one, like if there was an index of NPS or something, we could maybe insert that and then median CLV, but we don't have those data points for all these brands. So it'd be really, really hard to actually get here, but an individual brand could do it for themselves. It's funny, like in the office the other day, we were like joking around me and my brother, Luke and Tony, and we were like, how Tony has, you know, rush on his computer. So you can see how many search volumes there, so how much search volume there is for each of our names. And so we were like comparing and saying like, I'm X times more famous than you based on the number of sure. people that search your name or whatever. So I think that's like really what I'm saying is that like, how many people could identify your brand? They know who you are. They could name your product. They could show them the logo. They could identify you, whatever you want. It's a really powerful thing that I think really matters in the amount of education that you have to do to sell them a thing. It's just like right. you have, you're starting from a, a little bit further down the road. Yeah. Kind of the uh, famous uh, Q score in Hollywood. Which That's is right. nobody, yeah. they don't reveal like the recipe. It's like you know, secret ingredients, let's say. But coming out of it, you can say definitively, I don't know what it would be today. Timothy Chalamet is the biggest male actor. Right. And like there's a way to, and then that Hollywood agencies or whatever, like business decisions based on Q score. And so I think like one thing as I was thinking about what's the, what would be the purpose of this? What could you use it for? And traditionally, it's used to evaluate companies, right? Like put a goodwill number, as they call it, against the value of a brand. But I think for those of us who are like running e-commerce businesses or CMOs for e-commerce businesses, I think this is an interesting maybe indication of where you need to do some work. And by which I mean, like you have a, let's say a relatively low score compared to somebody else in the same space. I don't know who you'd compare yourself to. You can then conclude from that, that working on brand building is something that is critical to us. And here, here's the number I can point to show why that might be the case. So I think we should maybe spin this into a conversation about like, how do you do that? Maybe starting with what is brand and then what can you do about it? So again, if we take brand, let's think about this mathematically. So let's accept my equation for a second. Mm. Let's just say that brand is the output of these three things, right? Well, then you very quickly can get to a much clearer set of actions about how to improve your brand, right? So if we go to the first category, brand awareness, now this is about how many people can you get to become aware of who you are, right? So this is just volume. Now impressions matter, right? And so this, this is a thing that like, in our world, yes, yes. we have lost view of the idea that 
a lot of people seeing us interacting with us matters. And I, I just think that that's not true, that it really does matter. And that now not all impressions are equal. So I think that we should still be trying to arbitrage the cheapest quality impression, high quality impression that we can get. Or Gary Vaynerchuk talks a lot about like cheapest attention, right? So he would take it a little bit step further in terms of the amount uh, that you need from the person on that impression to really qualify it. But the idea is you want to find out the best ways to get as many of those as you can. And that's still a valuable thing to do. And brand lift studies, I think from both Google and Facebook are attempts at doing this, right? This is where you'll get those questions about, have you seen this brand? Have I actually created awareness of who you are? And so they'll show a series of people ads, they'll have holdout groups, and then they'll ask a question in their feed of like, hey, do you remember seeing this ad over this period of time or whatever? Or do you have an intention to shop for this brand or given the consideration, would you shop for this brand? These are all things that you can actually measure and get track of. And I think especially brands that are in the, let's say north of 25 million range should be a part of their process on the awareness side. So that's like right. category one, right? Category two is around sentiment. And I think this is another thing that all the time, we do this all the time at, in a service business, right? Like we call it the pulse at CTC. We're constantly asking our customers a series of questions on a scale of one to five to get a sense of their experience of us and their feelings about us, right? Because that's what's going to come out when someone asks us about, asks them about us, right? And so that's going to help to either propagate and create advocacy or a detractor, right? On the NPS scale, you can think of that as like, those are the two sort of categories they're putting people in, advocates or detractors, right? So whether you use NPS, whether you use some sort of survey, I think a sentiment analysis about both the, the non-yet customers and then the customers themselves are, is another valuable data point that I would work towards. And then if you have negative sentiment, what can you do to resolve it? How do you create a more positive sentiment about your brand? That's experiential. That's in terms of just the value to cost ratio expectations and delivery, all sorts of ways to do that. But I think that's more about the alignment of the brand promise that you make, which is a thing to consider. And then the third one, CLV, we, we don't need to go, there's a million infinity tactics to improving that, but you can see how the equation gives you an obtuse idea like brand and allows you to be practical about measuring it. And mm -hmm. there's a really cool company, I know I'm going long here, Richard, I'll let you back in one second, <laughs> called Tracksuit. Um, our track star, Tracksuit, I'm going to look this up real fast. Tracksuit, that, that what they're trying to do is basically give you an ability to assess this all the time in an ongoing dashboard. It's called gotracksuit.com, a company out of Australia. I've talked to them a few different times. And they basically, in the same way that they do polling data in the United States for political candidacy, are taking a series of in-market customers in a product category and asking them questions about you, both sentiment analysis and awareness analysis, at, on a recurring, consistent basis to give you a definitive tract awareness and sentiment over time. And I think mm -hmm. that's going to become the kind of thing that, and what we're working on and what I've talked to them about is, could we take that data and run a corollary to Facebook performance to see if improvements are connected to each other in any way that would sort of get that idea. And so I think that that kind of work is super interesting and stuff works for it. Yeah. No, I think it's the ability to reclaim the idea of awareness as important via creating measurable metrics around it is, is definitely interesting because I think that's certainly a thing that's been missing at, or rather in the e-commerce world for a while is the idea that like people simply knowing and feeling something about your brand is important, right? All that matters is like, are they going to buy today? Which obviously is important for a lot of reasons, but it is easy to lose sight of the long-term effect of a lot of people being aware of your brand. Um, and then I think too, it, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it'd be interesting to dive deeper into how you measure the sentiment score because like thing that's sort of missing at least explicitly from this for me is that idea of it's not only feeling positive or negative but like the sort of subcategories of feeling that exist right which is like does it look good is the branding whatever i'm being sold like particularly for brands that aren't like aren't household names yet right a lot of like brand consideration there the sentiment is like does it looks like they took or does it look like they take care right with their brand make it look right, right. make it dialed in and that kind of thing. so you're saying that you would like to see some consideration or question regarding does the brand connect to your idea about the brand like how, how would you actually yeah. phrase or what you no, expect out of this yeah. product category or what you're looking for out of a car brand basically like does this mm -hmm. meet what you're hoping to see out of a I yes that's right and what you're you sort of pointed out that I guess that is cons considered, but I think like when you are calculating the sentiment score, 
which let's say is the final score in a series of calculations around not just like surveying people to see how they feel about the brand, but also right. thinking about maybe nuances to it. So you can think about the levers that you can pull. Because I think it's easy to say that like, oh, positive or negative sentiment about, about a brand revolves around, do people look inside themselves and think, oh, I like them or, huh, I don't. It's more like, what are the like little intangible things that are making people more inclined to be drawn to your brand, that kind of thing. I guess yeah. I'm saying like, where's the creative element? <laughs> you know? So I think a good example of this. So there's a brand that was born out of, stay with me for a second, because this is, I'm going to wade back into the NFT world for a second, sure. but it's, I'm going to pull it back out. So you remember Poolside FM, like the, it was like, it started as a music channel that was just like, sort of a Poolside FM. It was just like a way to like oh, yeah, yeah. play vibey music on a channel. And they began as this cool music product. And it was, that was just really all it is. It's like you would throw on Poolside FM if you're having a party and you want some good vibes. And it's like, rather than picking Spotify or Pandora, it's like this very specific subset of things. Okay. That turned into an NFT project called Vacation. And that is like a, if you look up Ocean Inc., you'll see that the whole vibe is this very like retro, almost like, it's like 80s vacation style, like hot pinks and blues, like this very specific brand vibe that they created around this NFT oh, project. Yeah. And now they've released sunscreen and they have a perfume and they created this whole NFT project that launched this all. Okay. And so it's this mm. brand that like for product existed, there was brand, right? There was right. an identity that actually preceded product. And now the idea that they could sell hotels, they could sell towels, the whole set of things that fit within the vibe that began as a music player that turned into an nft that now opens an opportunity for a network of things and by all accounts it's funny because my uh, one of my good friends dave charn who's been on this podcast he and i will argue about this a lot because i see it things often sometimes from the product lens and i'm like sunscreen is a horrible product category they've got to be doing terrible and he sees it very much from the brand category. And he's like, you're missing the forest through the trees. Like you're, you're getting hung up on this thing. And by all accounts, they're doing really well in this moment. And I think that right now, this to me represents a potentially more interesting direction of what it means to build something that matters than my sunscreen is better than every other sunscreen. Look at the features and benefits, margin, et cetera that's going to be tough. But I think that there's right. something deeper here that begins to play out that has at least higher upside, I would argue, than just something that's product isolated without the brand. I, mean, I think one thing you're pointing out is that this brand has a magical ability to overcome a lot of business woes, let's say, that's or right. drawbacks. So you point out, for instance, like, yeah, sunscreen is maybe a terrible business to get into based on X and Y thing, you know, certain product costs, whatever it happens right. to be. But if you have the brand behind it, it doesn't matter because people will pay you enough money for the product to kind of cover over a whole number of bills. And another yeah, big I've... thing, and it's funny, so Shireen Adamati, who used to work at CTC and now is now head of growth at Bobby, I think she's experienced this a lot at Bobby, which is a really fast growing company, which is that like part of what also enables growth is PR. And PR mm -hmm. is having a story worth talking about. And having a story worth talking about creates free impressions, which creates volume and awareness, which drives to more ad efficacy. And so the other question is not just what is the brand and is the sentiment positive or negative, but is it worth talking about? Is it interesting? So there's also, yeah. I think, or novel or something in a way that's going to spread because it's a story to tell. And I think that some of these brands, when you don't have that, you're grinding out on a paid basis, every impression and every interaction and there's no halo organic flywheel. There's no virality. There's nothing that supplements it. And eventually that just degrades down to nothing. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing is that the, just the absence of anything interesting is not a good business to be in. Yeah, it's fascinating. This is a bit of a digression, but there's a, uh, one thing that really got me thinking about brand a lot initially was if you've ever been on Netflix, you watch a reality TV show called Terrace House which is uh, okay. set in Japan, or it's a Japanese reality show. And it's just so brother, they come in. But of course, it's a lot more light, let's say, than an American version. <laughs> but one thing that's interesting is every one of those kids on that show, it's like the, they're between like 21 and the oldest guy's like 30, maybe. And a bunch of these guys go in and out. Every one of them owns a apparel brand of some kind. They have some small brand, and all it is, they all are sourcing shirts from the same guy, whatever. 
and they just say create a logo and they put it on there and they sell the merch and that's what they do and that's their yep. whole business model now whether or not they're specifically successful i don't know but the idea there that you're selling a logo i mean there's a lot there's a lot of power to that you know, going on this vacation website i can already tell you i will probably buy one of these yes simply because being associated with somebody that's pulling this off so well is I think subconsciously. It's you, like it, you know? right? It, yeah. And a brand often is a way for brands to align themselves with individuals' identity. It makes it clear what you're saying about yourself by buying their product, right? And so I think that you as somebody who, you f you see yourself as a brand connoisseur and appreciation for that. It's almost yeah. like your purchase is a hat tip to the designers. It's like an mm -hmm. acknowledgement that you've built something here that is clear and, and you communicate something in a way that's worth saying. There's another one of my favorite brands right now is a company called Aku. Okay. This is another NFT project, which I know I'm, everyone's going to be like, you're, you and your NFTs, but okay. So think about my mission statement at CTC for the last 10 years, help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams, right? So this idea of dream language has been a huge part of my reality. I'm also a former baseball player, right? Who's got little kids who I want to help have aspirations. Aku is this story built by Micah Johnson, who's a former MLB baseball player turned artist who's built this reality around this young black boy who wants to be an astronaut. And the whole universe he creates is about being dreams and empowering kids with the capacity to dream that they could be anything, right? And there's all this merch and NFTs and this whole story being built around it that's going to turn into a movie and all these different things. And I've bought more merch from this company than any other like random clothing brand in the last while. And it's all because it all says like, they're these like almost childlike drawings and they say build worlds around dreams. And I'm just like, yeah, that's like, that's me, right? Like it connects to a brand I want for myself and an identity statement that I'm creating. And so in that, his ads are more effective to me. And I think that's really the key of what it does is it cuts through the noise of who is this? Why does it matter? Who's it for? And aligns positively with a sentiment for me such that I'm far more likely to purchase connecting all those dots. Yeah. It's like the, um, Mutual friend and brand guru, and DeWalt often says, like, why would you wear this or for your brand? Why would you wear a hat? Isn't that right. how he says it? Yeah, why would exactly. you wear your brand's hat? Why would somebody wear essentially like what I was saying with the, the Japanese kids on the reality TV show? Why would somebody go around wearing a T-shirt with the name of your brand on? And I think that's like a fundamental question to ask. And if you're thinking about your target audience, the people for whom the product is most useful or whatever, and then think about what kinds of shirts they wear. That becomes sort of interesting question, particularly when you think about the aesthetic of your brand, but also the way that you live it out and you communicate with your customers and all that. Yeah, I love that. It's such an interesting thing. Rather than like, I know a classic brand thing is like, what media sites do they consume? It's like, what are what's on the t-shirts like of the of, that they wear of your customer? Mm -hmm. The fascinating exercise in identity statement because our apparel, like even this, like this is such a great example. So I'm wearing Jack Henry. Okay, so Jack Henry, Hal Bardouche, founder of Jack Henry early CTC customer back in the day, just a fan. They opened a salon in my neighborhood and they're doing this like experiential. It's now their office slash resale store slash a salon. And I got my hair cut there and I was like, this is just like, and so I bought a t-shirt because I was like, this is just everything that is me. It's Costa Mesa. It's an entrepreneur that I have a connection to in a thing, an omni-channel experiential retail store. I love all of that. This shirt now represents something more than just a company that sells cosmetics, it's like it's there's a thing there that I begin to identify with that is uh, very clearly you can learn about me by understanding the, who Jack Henry is and what the shirt would say. Yeah. No, I think it's definitely important too, like when having these conversations to remember, I think that like the solutions to these problems are not, you're not going to sort of reason your way to them. I think we maybe we brought this up a couple, two, three weeks ago, but this idea that like the problems that you need to solve just in sales generally. But especially when thinking about brand is like, you're not solving logical problems, you're solving psychological ones. And so approaching them with that mindset before you go out to solve them, I think is really important because I think of a bunch of people were sitting around in a boardroom thinking like, hmm, what is the coolest shirt that we could wear or that we could produce for our brand to get people to wear it? You're not going to come out with anything. You have to be able to like think and be your customer and then create something. Like that. I think that's really important. That's right. So I um, think that I get, I also want to like just acknowledge why if you're a $3 million brand trying to figure out how to make cash tomorrow, this conversation sounds like, shut up. That doesn't help me solve <laughs> yeah. this very acute financial issue. But I really do think, and 
someone like Ezra, who I look up to a lot, who's been around this for so long, or even hopefully a little bit me can say to you like, hey, I've actually been there. And I know that even in that most acute moment, the obstacle might be the way. The thing that is actually least intuitive might be the thing to go for, which is like to really step back and ask yourself, why does this thing matter in the world so much so that everybody would need to talk about it? And what if I try to create experiences like that would that actually be the mechanism? Might that actually be the path out? Because I think sometimes we get into a very deep rut of uh, sameness and we want the sameness to produce an outcome that's abnormal. And it's just really hard for that to occur. And it's probably not like a small landing page optimization <laughs> tweak that's going to really unlock the thing that what, what I really believe you as an entrepreneur are after, which is a really awesome brand that produces really great financial outcomes for you. It's, it can be deeper than that. Yeah. And especially I think at, at that smaller level too, when all you're trying to do really is like stand out above the noise, right? That in that sense, brand becomes super, super important. And again, I'm thinking here from like, you know, from a purely a creative or design perspective, that's part of it, but it's like, how are you going to comport yourself as a whole, as a brand in order to make your fill in the blank product that probably a lot of other people make, how are you going to make that stand out? And the answer to that question is like thinking about your brand now, because it's going to pay off. I think that's, yeah. And it, yeah, it weaves in, there's so many great definitions of brands. Another one that Evan uses that I like a lot, which is like your brand is your culture on its best day. And I think about that a lot when I, again, going back to Jack Henry, and this is a good thing to wrap on is like, I walk into their salon slash office and what you see is like it's lived like it, it's a real thing and so that authenticity of who they are and how they've structured this experience aligns with the product aligns with the facebook ads aligns all the way through in a way that i go like it actually reinforces the authenticity reinforces to me that this is a thing that uh, is trustworthy and that i want to align with and i think it's like it's every piece of who you are you cannot manufacture like we used to joke we used to work with this customer that was a very old school sports brand and they we would joke that they could never call themselves innovative and have the office that they did just it wouldn't work because that wouldn't align <laughs> and be honest and so they should not try to be that they should try to be something else and so i think there's there's this really foundational starting point that is worth considering in who you are and how that shows up that leads to all these other things we're talking about part of the one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this is because this attempt to kind of create a new metric that then guides you towards very specific action steps and points out the issues you might be having. Yeah. And then actually I will say like, Taylor, you also teased this in that very same Twitter thread. Yes, I did. We're actually expanding on that. And we wanted to give you guys a little tease or a little sneak preview of building this, this uh, trick that we're calling GQ, which is growth quotient. Yep. Which is sort of, maybe we can call it, I don't know, uni unified theory of your brand's potential to grow quickly. And yep. so we're going to be rolling something out here really soon, which sort of breaks that down. Everybody will be able to go in, figure out their GQ and so forth. But yeah, Taylor, I don't know if there's something you want to expand on. So if I were to think about my and CTC's role in the world going forward is I think we have an opportunity to be sort of e-commerce anthropologist, right? Like where mm -hmm. part of what I think our job in the world is to do is to take advantage of the fact that we get to analyze and look at so many different things and try and answer the question, why did it work? Okay. It, this is really important. Why did it work? Why is the brand growing the way that it's growing? What are the commonalities amongst the brands that grow really fast, those that grow really slow? And so Richard, myself, and the rest of our data team, we've been spending a lot of energy around this question to try and say, what would it look like to begin to assess or to come up with a way to identify the kinds of brands that grow really quickly and grow continuously and produce it. Not, and when we say grow, we don't just mean top line revenue either. We mean produce profit and grow enterprise value over time. And I think that we're on to something really interesting with this and we're going to keep evolving it and we're excited to roll it out. Um, it's sort of hat tips to the anti-fragile playbook. If you've ever that from CTC to some of the other stuff that I've developed on our growth strategy training to just watching more and more of the brands that we have, especially over the last three years that have grown, not just on the back of COVID, but after COVID are continuing to produce wonderful results. And the good news is that there are a common set of things that exist that can be quantified, that can be measured to give you visibility into your GQ. 
And the funny thing is like IQ, like intelligent quotient, doesn't just, doesn't guarantee success and any more than I think GQ would, but it's an indication of the potential of success in a very real way that I think is going to be a helpful indicator for you, um, your team to think about what kinds of things are out there to improve upon. So we're excited about this and it's all sort of this brand thinking, this thinking, it's all connected to the same idea of trying to really dive into the history of e-commerce past, present, and future to figure out what makes something work and how we can provide you insight into it. Yeah. And so we'll have a future episode where we break that down a little bit more closer to the rollout of GQ itself, but I'm uh, really excited to show you guys. That's going to be a super useful tool for everyone.